I find it, uh, like I said, fun. <laughs> yeah, I can't believe it. I thought, you know, it would be kind of just like just little mountains you'd go on, right? And I thought, oh, it would be this, you just do easy runs. But I found out you can do almost, you can do the hardest run you want. More disabled people are trying it every year thanks to high profile events like the Canadian Championships. Most never become good enough to compete for their country or even their province, but that's not the point. What's the baby? Whoa! <laughs> that's what we're after. We're after more of a grassroots base to it. And, uh, I don't think it should be only for the elite athletes, but I think that all people who want to participate in skiing, there should be a place for them, and that's how it's evolving. Well, from the sidelines, it looks difficult, but really, you know, it takes about four days or five days of, you know, a couple hours a day, and, and you've been able to pick up quite a bit about how to make the thing edge properly. It's easy to free ski, but when you want to race, well, you're going to have to learn it like anybody else. Few in the world have learned to race better than the North Americans. 100 skiers from Canada, the U.S., Japan, and Germany will be in Whistler in March. As usual, the Canadians lead in modesty. They insist they are not the real team to beat. You got your U.S. team, which is, uh, has been 10 years ahead of us as far as technology and skiing is concerned, um, with mono skiing and stuff like that. So we've got a little catching up as far as that's concerned. but. Uh, you know, we're, we're a formidable force. We're a, we're a force to be reckoned with, for sure. I like to ride my bike. I do it all the time anyway. Figured I might as well do it to make money. So two years ago, 24-year-old Rob Mercero became a bike courier. I'm as fast as anybody is on the street, as far as I know. But from time to time, people have questions for him. They see it and they ask if it's a cast. I just tell them, no, it's a prosthetic. And if they want to ask another question, like, oh, when did that happen? Oh, when I was three and a half. Or how did that happen? Oh, it was a, it was a lawnmower. <laughs> My original amputation was here from a lawnmower. And uh, when I was seven, I had it amputated through here. It's called a Symes amputation. It's right through the ankle. I don't consider myself having a disability, I just consider myself having something different to offer and I can do the job just as good as anybody else, so why not do it? Hey Karen. Hi. They're filming me behind here. Oh, I heard about this. Mercero is sometimes surprised by the attention he gets. He races bikes competitively. He takes on so-called able-bodied athletes and wins. For him, it's never been an issue, and it's never been an issue for his boss, either. You don't usually think to ask people whether they have both legs uh, when they're applying for Bicycle Courier. Hi. He started work, I only found out months after the fact that uh, he was operating on one, but it's never been a factor, so, you know, you, you judge a guy on his performance, not uh, any other aspect. Mercero says he'll remain a bike courier for now. Yeah. Okay. Bye. But then again, the possibilities are limitless. It's considering going back into racing sometime in the future, but it's, uh, maybe in the mountain bikes instead of on the road, where it takes a little bit more skill and something I have to develop, really. I'm down here at uh, Bentall 2. I'm still holding the ones for the 10 block of Pender. There's, there's no limitations to anybody, you know, as long as they have an imagination and a will. Kelly McLugan, CBC News, Vancouver. The quiet halls of Eric Hamber's school in the evening, pierced by the sound of laughter. <laughs> I pass, let's just say that, yes. This is a class in improv comedy for beginners. And after just five nights, they're pretty good. One, two, three, one, two, three. And gradually it is able to sway back and forth Ooh. by itself. I think I'd like I do a lot of public speaking, but it's always about the subject that I study. And this, for two and a half hours, plants never even come into my mind. It's great. It's like a total holiday. I know it's <laughs> Not one of them ever plans to be a comedian. In fact, most of them are scientists. Thanks, Mom. 
I have a really hard time thinking on my feet in a professional situation, so I thought if I could come here and make an idiot of myself in front of people, then you I could have no certainly... trouble at work. That's right, that's right, and that's why I'm here. I wanted to take public speaking, but I th thought I'd make a fool of myself, though. so I thought I'd come here and make a fool of myself, and it would be okay. I want to just introduce you to a scene that is so difficult that it's actually easy. <laughs> For the instructor, this is more than just fun and games. Improv comedy involves teamwork and courage. I better do it. So we've established a problem in the scene, which is the mustard. <laughs> <laughs> no, this is going well, really. I, mean, I must say, this is a pretty courageous class. Yeah. Why? Why? Uh, because they're just so willing to get out there and take risks. And uh, it's amazing. You know, it's, it is frightening up there. No! Listen! <laughs> Now, they could have stayed home and watched people having fun on TV. Instead, they went to night school and made their own fun. That was excellent. Bob Nixon, CBC News, Vancouver. Okay. This, this is the front here. Right like that. Perfect. It starts with a funny vest that has colored flashing lights. You guys look quite fetching in those uh, outfits, you know. It's the black. Rather attractive. Yeah, yeah. They're very nice. It's not bad. Then there's a gun-like thing that shoots real laser beams. <coughs> what, was, what does that mean? You go from an airlock... Oh, well, that means we're going in. ...into a really dark maze. This is the dark zone, a laser tag business that's just opened in Surrey. The idea is to zap your opponent. Oh, it's you! Oh, no! And not get zapped yourself. I just got hit. Just fire away. That's all there is to it. You got me! We're, we killed each other. Yes! <laughs> Lorianne O'Connor built the first dark zone in Winnipeg. She's now expanding across Canada. The dark zone is probably the wildest interactive entertainment that's out right now. It's really like coming in with 29 other people. And getting into a video game. I'm damaged. Oh, I see what I'm doing wrong. Okay. Unfortunately, we do live in a violent society. Oh, God, I'm not. It's a lot less violent than anything you're going to see in a football game. <laughs> Am I dead? It's just a lot of fun. How did you do that? <laughs> this is not cheap. $7 for a 15-minute game. Whatever you do, do not let your children find out about this. Bob Nixon, CBC News, Surrey. <laughs> On this soap opera, they give it to you, you know? Like in the daytime soaps, you have to watch it like for like a year to get, you know? Here, they just like, you watch it one night and you get what they would give you like in two or three months. It's dirty every time. There's a lot of good dirt going on and, and it's always like, everyone looks good. A lot of sex. Everyone sleeps with everyone. It's just like university. <laughs> I'm single and it fulfills all my fantasies and desires. <laughs> He's gay. I don't know. Yeah. Waste of a good male, that's for sure. He's hot. He's smoking oh, yeah. hot. Smoking hot. Would more, how many people would you think are watching this show at home? Like? Oh, a billion. You can't. I know that my friend Carrie right now, you can't call her when Melrose Place is on. Busy. Click. Thousands of millions. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we miss a week or something, we call someone in Ontario, they'll give us the update on Melrose and then if she went on and tell us what's going on. So, I mean, but everybody at home in university, we'd all get together on, what did it used to be, Wednesday nights? We'd have wine and cheese, all the girls, and sit around and watch the Turn it back to him. You guys, the fans are coming on. It's kind of hot back here. <laughs> <laughs> Smoking. 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 And there's Kimberly. The, oh, she's a bit. She's wearing a wig, too, because uh, she's got a big scar on her head from the accident. God, my life is sad. <laughs> I think I know more about these people than my own life. <laughs> That's a good girl. Walk in. Go get it.
she has this agricultural Presbyterian work ethic that yeah, yeah. says she has to work, and she wo she will goof off and be a puppy, but she has to do what she considers to be an honest day's work. Okay, come in. Turn, go back, next tree, right round the tree, round you go. Good girl, off, up, back, last For border tree. collies like Sheila, Sheila tasks are there, essential. Behind you, come right. And they don't get, as a purpose, simply being with the family. The way that a golden retriever's purpose in life is just to be with the family, um, which is one of the things that makes Goldie such wonderful, wonderful family dogs. These are working dogs, and they have to work. If they don't work, they go crazy. That became evident to John Carlton when Sheila was only a puppy. So he gave her a purpose. He taught her how to take direction. Today, Sheila understands more than 100 words. Round to your right. Back to the far tree. Sheila, to your right. Now around the tree. Steady there, hold it there. Stop. Because she's a border collie, her heritage is sheep herding. And while there may be no sheep on Granville Island, doing this for an hour or so a day helps Sheila feel like she's earned her keep. It gives her a sense of self-esteem. windows are what Jamie Hilliard loves to create, so much so he's made it his business. But what provides a Christmas challenge this season is what he works on away from his day job. Underneath the plastic here we have um, quite a few different figures. This is a shepherd and uh, this is one of two angels. Nearly a dozen hand-carved figures line the walls of a workshop at home. Their pieces in a project designed by Hillier and his co-workers. Everything is being assembled right here on the screen. Um, actually, we're just working on the final positioning of the characters right now. In a couple of weeks, the characters will be positioned here on a platform on the sign in a life-size nativity scene 12 feet high and 16 feet long. It's a very big project no it is. Kidding. It's a really big project. So, uh, is, do we know? Is it the largest in Vancouver, BC? I, I, I have no idea. It's certainly the most laborious at this point. In the end, there will be eight coats of paint, two of them gold leaf. By the time the project's finished, it will have taken nearly 150 hours of work. Hillier's time is donated. St. Paul's is a special place. Um, they uh, have given great care and taken great care of people that I've known and loved who have uh, been patients there and have passed away there. We wanted to do something that would um, give back something to the community and uh, this project came up and so here we are. The Nativity Project has been commissioned to commemorate the hospital's opening 100 years ago. It's a gift for the hospital, it's a gift for Hillier. His work usually lives for a season. This will live for a lifetime. Belle Puri, CBC News, Vancouver.